it means that I can start. Climate variability impact on intense precipitation and floods. This is the title of my talk. And the structure of my talk consists of four elements, four parts. I will start by discussing briefly changes in flood risk, observations and projections, then introduction to climate variability, ENSO, intense precipitation and floods, and transfer functions from climate variability to floods, FLOVAR project. Let me start from changes in flood risk, observations and projections. Many floods with high material damage and fatalities have been recorded worldwide in last decades. This is the map covering 25 years, 1985 to 2010, and it stems from a flood observatory uh, established by Robert Breckenridge in the States, first in uh, Dartmouth, now in Colorado. So you see there are many red points everywhere, marking uh, the floods that are uh, considered in a flood observatory database. Many of them are in Russian Federation, but probably more dense are these red dots in Southeast Asia, in much of Europe, and um, eastern part of the, of the United States. Flood risk is composed of three elements. Flood hazards, exposure to floods, and vulnerability to floods. So a risk is a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Uh, sometimes this function is assumed to be a simple multiplication and sim simple product. And these three elements of risk depend on the climate system, terrestrial and hydrological system, and socio-economic system. They are complex interlinkages between these boxes. For instance, it is quite clear that climate system uh, drives flood hazard, but it is also related to terrestrial and hydrological system and to socio-economic system. Uh, one could make this, this story even more complicated, but I just marked the most important arrows in this uh, diagram. So it's, it is clear that in a warmer climate where there is more, uh, more water vapor can be held in, a, in the warmer atmosphere, there could be a potential of higher precipitation intensity and uh, floods. But it is not the only mechanism uh, driving flood hazard. Terrestrial and hydrological system also uh, plays a role, plays an important role, and especially land use and land cover changes, uh, primarily urbanization. So sealing of surfaces, less water can infiltrate and more water runs off. Eight years ago, I published or I, I edited a book that was published in Britain, Changes in Flood Risk in Europe. Uh, it's, a, it's a joint venture of many scientists, including Professor Kutsuyanis, who will speak after myself today. I'm very sorry that uh, Russian Federation is not included specifically, even if there is a Russian co-author, Olga Zolina, who who uh, contributed with an article on the chapter on intense precipitation. I think it's, a, it's an interesting book, even if it is eight years old. And I just recommend that if you, if you have uh, access to it, it may uh, 
contain useful uh, useful stories for you. And this is a diagram for our recent, well, relatively recent paper published in 2018 in hydrology research. The number of large floods of severity in excess of one and a half and magnitude in excess of five in Europe each year has been increasing, but not in a regular way. So there are ups and downs. In some years, like 2010, there was a huge number of large floods in Europe. And in 2011, only one. So we see more than 10 in 2010, only one in 2011. Uh, I do not have the time to explain what is severity, what is magnitude, but this has been defined in our, in, in, in this paper that I mentioned. And also it is available in a page, web page of the uh, Dartmouth Float Observatory because uh, Robert Breckenridge was a co-author of this paper of ours. So I was the first co-author and he was one of the three. Um, we produced these graphs based on the Dartmouth flat observatory data. But only we use a subset of data referring to larger floods. And now something from, uh, from uh, IPCC special report on extremes. Uh, chapter edited by Sonia Seneviratne et al, 2012. I'm sorry for a very busy uh, map. There are many boxes, many regional boxes. But since we have um, quite a number of international uh, spectators from all over the world, perhaps this map uh, is of some use. The frequency of heavy precipitation or the proportion of total rainfall from intensive events will likely increase over many over many areas of the globe. This is the uh, the message that comes from from a chapter by Sonia Seneviratne in a special report on extremes of IPCC 2012. But this particular map shows boxes, regional boxes, for many global regions. And for each region, we have a horizontal line at the level of 20. Solid black horizontal line at the level of 20. It refers to a 20th century, 20 year, 24 hour precipitation complex, sorry for that, but it is just a 20 year return, return value of one day or 24 hour precipitation for the late 20th century. And now they are box plots in different colors, showing you projections of return periods in years for the future, for two future horizons. 2046, 2065, and 2081 to 2100. And for three uh, scenarios, now they are not so brand new scenarios. They are scenarios from stress, special report on uh, emission scenarios of IPCC 2000. Now uh, it's, it is RCPs that are more frequently used, but here, they are SRX, B1, A1B, and A2 scenarios. You may see that all the box plots, uh, or nearly all, all parts, color parts of the box plots, are below, uh, below the level of 20, which means that what used to be a 20 year precipitation, intense precipitation, in a future is likely to be much more common, much more frequent, like uh, 10 instead of 20. And in somewhere, in some places, even more frequent than 10. 
for instance, Central Asia for A2 projection 2081-2100, it is maybe seven, seven and a half. So what used to be a 20 year precipitation is likely to come three times more frequently. Maybe for Alaska, Northwest Canada, for this box, it is even, even more common. The same for Eastern North America and Eastern Canada. But everywhere, the uh, future intense precip heavy precipitation is likely to be more common, more frequent than in the historical reference period. Uh, long time ago, I had an honor and pleasure to be a part of a team who published a paper in science. The first author was Chris Milley. And this paper, Stationarity is Dead, with our water management, made quite an impact, cited well over 2,000 times. The principal message that we deliver in this article was a map, this map. Projection of changes in annual runoff, we compare 2041 to 2060 versus 1900 to 1970. For stress, which is special report on emission scenarios, A1B scenario. Color represents a medium from 12 climate models. Presence of the color means that eight or more models agree as to the direction of change. And if you see a hatching over a country or a province or a state, this means that there is a strong agreement of 11 or 12 models as to the direction of change. Um, there are many papers producing uh, this sort of maps, but I show it, show it to you because we were early. So this was perhaps the first map of this sort. It doesn't refer to floods, it refers to annual runoff. But there is a strong message that you can see here. Namely, what is blue already, what is humid already, is likely to be even more humid in the future. And what is arid already, like the Mediterranean basin, or Colorado, Mexico, is likely to be more arid in the future. Now, there is some controversy about it, and there are many papers uh, stating that, well, come on, be careful. You cannot say that it's a general rule, humid becomes more humid and dry becomes more dry. Maybe it's not a general rule, but to a large extent, this is true, I think. And if you don't see a color, this may mean that, that models disagree. We need at least eight models out, out of 12 showing the same direction to use a color. So a white spot means, sorry, models disagree. And it is not only in part of uh, Sahara, Africa, but this is also in part of the United States, in some American states. There are also white colors. Nowadays, we have many, many papers with projections of flood risks. Yukiko Hirabayashi was the first author of paper published in Nature climate change in 2013, 2013, where 
the projected changes in frequency of a 100-year river discharge. They covered the whole globe. And uh, the message is that the average color of our continents is bluish, which means more floody. A hundred-year flood likely to become uh, more frequent, like uh, 50 or 20 in uh, Brazil. Uh, so I think that Yukiko Hirabayashi, who is among your lecturers, she will talk to you this week. She may refer to this map, one of many maps that exist now. But the problem is that these maps may disagree. So, Uh, if maps disagree, it's a problem for practitioners, for adaptation, and for flood relief people. However, since there are some, uh, some spectators, some students from uh, China, I would like to... Uh, inform you about our brand new paper published in BANS, which is a bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, just in August, a few weeks ago. It is uh, in open access. You may have it if you want. You may have the contents. I, I was a corresponding author and I, I uh, published this paper together with Chinese colleagues led by Professor Jiang Tong from uh, Nanjing. Our story, our principal message in this paper is that each half degree of warming increases annual flood losses in China by more than 60 billion American dollars. It makes a difference, indeed. And now, you see how the return period, which used to be a hundred year, we talk about a hundred year flood, in a historical time, is greatly reduced for different uh, levels of warming. So even for a one and a half degree warming, it goes down from 100 to 70 year, then below 70 for two, two degrees, and like 40 for two and a half and four degrees. I led a paper, which is also in public access, uh, demonstrating differences in the flood hazard projections in Europe, their causes and consequences for decision making. There are huge differences in flood hazard projections. I think we understand them. We understand the uncertainty and we explain, we interpret this uncertainty. However, for the practitioners, it means a, it means a big problem. It means a big problem because the practitioners do not know what to do. If if they have different information about the future flood hazard. Introduction to climate variability. Uh, there are many modes of climate variability or interannual and interdecadal oscillation in the ocean atmosphere system. Perhaps the most best known uh, examples of climate variability refer to the Pacific and to the Atlantic. So en ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, is probably the most common or well best known oscillation mode. AMO, Atlantic, Multidecadal Oscillation, PDO, Pacific Decadal, NAO, North Atlantic Oscillations. But there are many more. 
including Siberian high intensity pattern. Nino 3.4 uh, is just an example of ENSO. Um, the colors show you the uh, intervals when O and I, oceanic Nino index, is below 0.5, minus 0.5, or over plus 0.5 for, well, if the uh, moving average over three months is below minus 0.5 or over 0.5 for five consecutive months, then we declare this El Nino or La Nina. Uh, we used uh, wavelets to show the quasi-periodic uh, properties of ENSO. And we thought it would make sense to try and combine climate variability and uh, global temperature. Because there is a, there is a gradual trend. But there are big oscillations, upwards and downwards from the trend. So together with uh, my Polish colleague Ilona Pinskor and Professor Demetris Kutsoyannis, who will speak after me, we published a paper recently. Actually, it is online already now, but it will be published in December this year in the science of the total environment. I think that the title of our paper is self-explanatory. Variability of global mean annual temperature is significantly influenced by the rhythm of ocean atmosphere oscillations. Uh, the warming is there. We used a 30 year, shifted 30 year intervals to compare the temperature increase. And in the last 30 year intervals, interval 1990 to 2019, the temperature, temperature increase was 2.10 degrees, quite a lot. So more than ever before. And now we tried to uh, see how residual from five year running mean of the global temperature perform in comparison to the running mean, five-year running mean of equatorial SOI, which is Southern Oscillation Index, characterizing and so. We selected this figure, this diagram, as a graphical summary, graphical abstract of our paper. What it shows is that these two time series are in quite a strong counter, counter phase, not in phase, but counter phase. SOI is in counter phase to temperature and the uh, variability of SOI explains over 40% of variability of global temperature. So I refer to an old cartoon. A landlady comes to, uh, to the house and she, see, she sees that there is a mess. Probably the mess was, was done by, the, by a dog, but the dog works, the cat did it. So I say, El Nino did it, easy culprit. But we, we didn't refer to El Nino only. We analyzed PDO and AMO. So we see AM, AMO has also a strong link to a global temperature. And AMO, variability of AMO explains also more than 40% uh, percent of temperature variability. So uh, you may look at individual peaks, they, they nicely match in both time series. Now, also intense precipitation and floods, which is the essence 
of well, a very important part of my talk. Uh, as I said, Enzo, and in particular, warm episode of Enzo, which is El Nino, called El Nino, uh, with warm water near to Peruvian coast of the Pacific, brings teleconnections. So in many places all over the world, there is some special uh, prevalence to uh, wetness or dryness. Nearly everywhere it is warm. So during El Nino, during the warm phase of Enzo, it's, it's warmer than, than usual, warmer than average in many places. But not everywhere. You see that in, in, in Florida, for instance, it is wet and cold. But then, in some areas all, all over the world, there is a wet spell. So there is a higher probability of, of uh, having a wet spell and uh, possibly floods. In contrast, in other areas, it is uh, dryness that is slightly. So this is not the only map of this sort that you can see. This was produced by NOAA, National Weather Service. But the other one, showing influence of El Nino on rainfall, produced by International Research Institute for Climate and Society, IRI, uh, is slightly different from the one that I presented a moment ago, because this one refers to December, February, and this one refers to any month. So you see, uh, during El Nino, there is a likelihood of wet spell in, uh, in the Horn of Af Africa, in uh, Pakistan, in uh, Southern United States, and in, there are two green areas in uh, South America as well. And also, actually three, three areas. One is in Peru and two others are on the Atlantic coast and, uh, and Pacific coast of South America, Southern South America. For La Nina, the likelihood of wet spell is higher than normal uh, in Australia. This is quite a quite a strong signal that that you may see here. So you see, in some areas, uh, some areas are more prevalent to floods during El Nino, and other areas are more prevalent to floods during La Nina. Sometimes these areas are next to each other, you see. Um, during La Nina, this part of the uh, Indian Peninsula is uh, likely to be wet, but next to it, likely to be dry. Different, in different months, though. So dry from January, January to May, wet from June to September. Similar story in America. Dry horizontal belt, starting from California, January to April, and then Florida, October to following April. Whereas, northwards from this belt, it's wet from December to March. In 1997, there was a huge flood in Poland, really huge flood. Our principal 
weekly magazine, Politica, had a cover story related to the flood four times. Probably this is the world record. I don't think that anywhere in the world was the flood the cover story topic for four weeks, as it was in summer 1997. And some journalists said, well, maybe this is El Nino. No, no, no. I said no. Scientists say no. 1997 flood in Poland had nothing to do with El Nino. Now I'd like to refer to uh, uh, important paper by Philip Ward and colleagues, many colleagues are from the Netherlands, declaring or uh, showing strong influence of El Nino Southern Oscillation flood risk around the world. Complex story that you can see here. Anomaly in 100 year flood volume. Upper panel El Niño years versus all years. Lower panel, La Niña years versus all years. So we see if there is a black, black if, if there is a blue or bluish spot, it means that flood, flood volume is higher than average. On an upper panel during El Niño, bottom panel during La Niña. Complex, messy story. However, if you think of an uh, anomaly in expected, annual expected flood damage, then they are more regionally organized responses, according to this paper in PNAS by Philip Ward and colleagues. And in the Russian Federation, during El Nino, also there is a, according to these authors, there is an area with higher prevalence for flood damage. Another paper, this one published in Nature Communications, is in free access. So open access, you can, you can have this paper, and I think it's useful. It tells you that the that the picture for likelihood of ENSO-driven flood hazard is complex. Indeed, it is complex. This set of maps refer to, uh, to the left, to El Nino, to the right, to La Nina. Upper panels, probability of normally, abnormally low or abnormally high flows, abnormally low, in red or reddish colors, abnormally high in bluish. And the bottom panels show pro uncertainty, so uh, uncertainty estimates. Th this was for February only. And now for maximum probability of increased flood hazard during any month. During El Nino, up, upper panel, and during La Nina, lower panel. There is a strong response in uh, Northeast, uh, Northeast Brazil, South Africa, and the so whole of Austral Australia, where the uh, uh, maximum probability of abnormally high flow is uh, during La Nina. The last part of my talk, refers to a published project, FLOVA. The title of this part is Transfer Functions from Climate Variability to Precipitation, Intense Precipitation and Floods. So the title of the project, Interpretation of Change in Flood Related Indices Based on Climate Variability, explains the acronym FLOVA. Based on climate variability, we want to make inference on uh, flood-related indices. So we, we look for a transfer function. 
between climate variability and flood rated indices. The structure of the project is as follows. Work package A is meta-analysis, so analysis of literature, rich literature. Work package B, constructing data repository. There is a lot of data available. C, event-based analysis for selected episodes. D, temporal structure of indices of natural climate variability. E, spatial temporal structure of flat related variables. And finally, work package F, which is not ready yet. Seeking relations between indices of climate variability and flood related variables. I said it is not ready yet, but it's going to be ready in the forthcoming months because two gentlemen, two young, young gentlemen, two students wish or have to produce their thesis, master thesis, by mid November. But no, it's not ready yet. Still, we published a paper last year about climate variability and floods, a global review. It's open access in water. Uh, in, this pro in this paper, we produce the following map of regional predisposition to ab abundance of water. So you see, there are areas where abundance of water is more likely during El Nino than normal, or during La Nina, or during NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation positive phase, which is in a much of a Northern Europe, or in a negative phase in the Southern Europe and Northern Africa. PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillations, and MAO also play the role according to references that we spotted. And we also submitted a paper about climate variability and floods in China, a review. It is now in re-review and we are optimistic, but I'd like to show you a few slides from based on this paper. So you see, Large El Nino or a strong warm phase of El Nino uh, of Enzo coincides with a uh, high annual precipitation in China. This happened in 1973, 1983, 1998, and 2016. So you see there is a peak of Nino 34 and a peak in a annual precipitation, average precipitation in China. Uh, we have data from uh, China Meteorological Administration where some of the, uh, the co-authors, Chinese co-authors work. Indeed, 1998 was a big flood in China with more than five and a half thousand people killed, a huge, material damage and the reason of the flood was a daily precipitation in excess of 300 millimeters noted at some stations in six days. El Nino did it. Well, maybe. Annual precipitation total versus moving average of Nino 3-4 index for uh, annual precipitation in China and summer precipitation in China show some link. The uh, correlation is not very strong, but R square is 0 0.2605 for, for annual, less for summer. And in this Air Sciences Review paper, we, this is a literature review, so it is based on published uh, articles. We noted areas where people, other researchers, found links between El Nino and uh, intense precipitation, heavy precipitation, and floods in much of China. Uh, PDO also plays a role 
so there are some links uh, between a, a PDO index and annual precipitation and summer precipitation over China. Not as strong as ENSO, but also uh, it's interesting, I think. Um, in this review paper, we also noted that a specific aspect of non-stationarity concerns related to climate variability is important for flood frequency studies and for water management and for flood preparedness. Because a hundred year flood determined for the site of interest from all years of record can be considerably different from a hundred year flood determined only from a subset like uh, El Nino or La Nina years. So this is one remark referring to practice, to water management and flood preparedness and natural disaster uh, risk reduction. But on the other hand, if, if such links between climate variability and flood propensity or predisposition to floods over some regions, some areas, proves to be uh, strong, then there is a possibility of improving stream flow forecast lead time using uh, oscillations of a uh, ocean atmosphere system. So actually, it is an old story. There are whole books on that. El Nino famines, devastating floods in Pakistan, 2010 during La Nina, and then a strong drought, a huge drought in Pakistan in 2004 and 5. However, people try to dig deeper into the past and go to remote past, like uh, hundreds of years, or even a, or even a millennium, uh, using proxy-based climate reconstruction. Information encrypted in uh, tree rings and corals, and there are other proxies as well. So trying to extend the uh, existing national hydrometeorological records compiled by national hydrometeorological services in the instrumental period. By proxy-based data, we can go back to remote past. In a very short time, I think in one minute, my time will be over. So uh, let me finish my talk by the acknowledgement to uh, financial support from the project, interpretation of change in flood related indices based on climate variability or FLOVAR, funded by the National Science Center of Poland. So we are very glad that, uh, uh, that our Polish National Science Center funded this research and the ongoing project that will end in uh, it will end on the 30th, 31st of March 2021. Uh, I think we'll, we'll have uh, uh, interesting results. So thank you for uh, attention. I hope that the technical uh, technical part was okay that uh, that the uh, signal was there, both uh, voice and uh, and a picture. And my last slide, my thank you slide uh, refers to the ocean. Because indeed, climate variability is a manifestation of oscillation in an ocean atmosphere system. Should you have any comments or questions, of course, I'm ready to respond to them now. But I also give my, my uh, email address, kunzevich.yahoo.com, 
Thank you once again for attention. Professor Kunzevich, thank you very much for such a comprehensive uh, lecture. In 45 minutes, you managed to cover all these global uh, issues, global coverage of the flood problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. But I cannot, I, I do not have a, a ruler to switch off the share screen. Uh, on top, is it... there is a red uh, ah, button. Okay. Just uh, stop sharing. Sorry. I had the same problem, so you're not the only one. I see, I see, I see on the top so stop sharing good stop thank sharing. you thank you yes excellent thank you very much um so um <clears throat> now we uh, collected a number of questions coming from the uh, audience uh, both audience uh, in the hall that you see uh, on the screen and uh, also from the virtual audience uh, and um, um the question moderators, moderators of questions collected them for me to be posed to you. So first question is coming from Suhail Ahmed. Uh, Professor Kunzevich, I'm working on effects of climate change on trends of future variability of precipitation by using GCM data. Do you know any source of best GCM data to work on? Please suggest. Problem because there are very, very many data sets that are available. So in fact, choosing the optimal data is, a, is an important thing uh, and not, not a trivial uh, decision. I think the discussion published by Archfield in Water Resources Research in 2015 uh, would help you select uh, optimal uh, optimal database for, for your purposes. You know, I applied for another project. Even as an old man, I applied in a, in a competition. And we consider a special work package devoted to this issue, how to select the optimal data sets, because you have many options. So we will work on this in six months. It's not for a one one minute response. Of course, thank you very much. Uh, I'm moving uh, to the next question. Uh, the question is: What is the contribution of anthropogenically caused warming in global flood changes? In global flood changes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So anthropogenic uh, uh, factors causing the right. warming. Right. So. Uh, the contributions are strong and they are twofold. One and very easy is that people, uh, well, maybe, maybe threefold. So one is uh, social economic. People still live in unsafe places and they have more to lose now. So the uh, damage potential has grown. This is quite clear. Second, uh, terrestrial and hydrological systems have changed. Lots of sealed surfaces. Water does not infiltrate, it runs off. So uh, uh, this is another anthropogenic, uh, clearly anthropogenic effect. And climate. Uh, well, according to IPCC, nine it is uh, extremely likely that uh, the reason of uh, uh, reason of uh, warming is anthropogenic. I know that Professor uh, Kutsuyanis, who will speak after me, has a somewhat uh, different opinion about that. But the mainstream and the majority of scientists say anthropogenic. So, anthropogenic warming and. Uh, and uh, more room for water vapor in a warmer atmosphere. So there are three, I would say, sets of anthropogenic reasons that I listed. Okay? I don't hear you, sorry, I can't hear you. Professor Solomati, I can't hear you. Uh, very right, you cannot no, hear okay. me because I was muted, yes. Okay. Uh, technology, we're still uh, trying to understand how it works. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this uh, answer. Indeed, uh, there are different opinions. 
Uh, but we have to move to the next question. So uh, Boris Gartsman asks, Professor Kunzevich, could you comment on the following, and there is a quote, frequency of 100-year flood discharge, a quote, unquote. It seems a bit contradictory. Well, 100-year flood is a frequent design flood. It is used in hydrological design. And depending on the 100 years that you, uh, depending on the time horizon that you have the data for, you may have different 100 year floods. So uh, this means that stationarity is dead. And not only because of climate, it's more general. The climate has been changing all the time before humans as well. So uh, uh, what used to be a hundred year flood in the past, in a reference period, is likely to be more frequent. So it becomes 90 year flood or 70 year flood or 50 year flood, or maybe 150 year flood. Not necessarily more frequent, just a different, uh, different frequency. Is this clear? I hope so. For the listener, it uh, could be clear. For me, yes. Uh, so we have to move. Thank you very much. We move to another question. I try to be also to throw questions from geographically uh, distributed areas. So we had uh, one question from Ahmed, then two questions from Russia. Now uh, there is a question from France, from Mark Erlich. Hello, Mark. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. Is the improvement of modeling capacity dealing with the spatial uncertainty of climate change impact only related to computational capacity for data assimilation? Well, first of all, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I, was, I was honored by Dr. Mark Ehrlich, uh, who listened to my talk. We have met each other several times in the past. Um, uncertainty in climate projections are still strong, are, st are still high. Uncertainties are high there. Uh, that's why we say projections and not predictions, because we do not want to pretend that, uh, that we are in position to issue predictions. Yes, assimilation is, a, is an imp important uh, opportunity and possibly it, be, it brings hope. But in my personal opinion, I would be even more hopeful if the climate models and hydrological models work better in the, for the reference period. If we could mimic the past fairly well, reasonably well, then I think this, this could bring uh, um, a hope. And people are trying to improve the situation here, but we are far away from the satisfactory state. Indeed, conclusion of any, of any research is that more research is needed. Uh, thank you, Professor Kunzevich. We move with the questions. We still have some time. Uh, back to Russia. And Nikolai Yasinsky uh, asks the following question. Professor Kunzevich, do you think that already now discharge data filtered by El Nino and La Nina years is more useful in estimating the 100 years and other statistical values in engineering hydrology? I would think so, that for not everywhere in the world, I demonstra demonstrated to you many global maps. Some of them are kind of a public relations uh, maps that do not show a lot of detail, but they really show for what areas it is more likely that a 
high flat comes during a linear year or la nina year so this is an information that engineers and decision makers dealing with disaster re risk reduction and uh, flood preparedness should take into account for those areas where there is a strong climate variability signal it is never deterministic so if the, even even if there is a strong el nino there is no guarantee that you will have a flood in a, in the area that is on average uh, has a predisposition to be flooded during the el nino year there is no guarantee but there is a high probability and how high well depends depends where but it can be 60 percent so it's not negligible that's why i think already now there is a signal in uh, climate variability of interest and of importance for people dealing with flood risk reduction thank you thank you very much uh, for this uh, answer so we have uh, two questions left uh, so one question is uh, again from Russia, from Alexander Tarasov. Question is this, are there any predictions about floods during midwinter thaws? Well, this is where I think you have a big role to play. I do not know Russian hydrology very well. So, unfortunately, in the literature that we reviewed, I could not find anything, which means room for you, because there can be a signal. But we are sorry we are not aware of it. Okay. It is for you to discover if there yes. is one or not. Thank you very much. So, in other words, uh, in other words, uh, Alexander Tarasov initiative should be punished. So it's no, for no, you no. to answer it's... this. No, no, I'm kidding. I just okay. tried to make a joke. <laughs> okay. It means that uh, researchers should do more to answer this question. I think so. Yes. Okay. And, and to publish uh, in uh, international uh, journals. Uh, that's so... for sure. This is maybe appeal to all young uh, generation that is listening to us. And not to publish and perish, but simply to publish your interesting results. And, to publish uh, and stay. And, and stay, that's correct. Okay, we have a last question uh, coming from Uganda, from Rwax Godi Godfrey. And question is a bit provocative. It says, it, it, it reads as follows. Whereas the models seem to be centering on European climate, it should be noted that Africa fairly maintains the same climate all year around? Well, I'm humble and I must say, indeed, probably Europe was my major. I have participated in European projects. I have published uh, papers on Europe, edited a book on Europe. So uh, I ignore many other regions. Uh, perhaps this, this has been changing already because I collaborate with China. But with Africa, well, I do not have personal experience, but the reviews that I uh, made, and also some of the maps that I showed, if you go back to my slides, they show that in Africa, there is a strong signal re related to La Nina or El Nino. So again, I'm, I'm really uh, encouraging this, uh, this student who asked a question to have a look. Thank yes, you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kunzevich. On my uh, side, I would like to add, uh, uh, as you may know, I'm a professor at Institute for Water Education in Delft, and we're training many uh, hydrologists and engineers from various countries and many from Africa and practically all of them talk about indeed 
uh, changing climate and uh, changing uh, hydrological and meteorological conditions during the uh, last decades. So it would be interesting indeed to look at this uh, problem more uh, actively. Uh, Professor Kunzevich, uh, so we have actually more questions, but we exhausted uh, our time. I would like on behalf of the audience uh, to thank Professor Kunzevich for this inspiring uh, lecture, which not only brings uh, uh, the review of the problems, but also poses a number of questions which are to be answered by the young audience that is uh, listening uh, to us. And uh, with this, uh, we finish our first lecture at this uh, uh, school. So we have now a 13 minute break and we resume uh, at 16.15 sharp, Moscow time. So it's 15.15 uh, Central European summer time with the lecture of uh, Professor Kotsoyanis. Professor Kunzevich, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.